Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Before you sit down, the first half of the church year, I've said this a number of times, it focuses on the events of Christ. That being his birth, his baptism, his temptation, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. But then the second half of the church year focuses on the teachings of Christ. It's why everything turns green. Because we're meant to grow by the teachings of Christ. And here this morning, he teaches us how to treat our neighbor, specifically the neighbor that we hate or that hates us. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Be seated. From the Old Testament, we heard of Joseph, who actually is a type of Christ. He prefigures our Lord, forgiving his brothers, the very brothers who, as you recall, tore his clothes, cast him into a pit, sold him into slavery, and then convinced their father through deception that he was dead. Years later, Joseph oversees the whole of Egypt. He has more authority and more power than any of us can even imagine. And his brothers come asking him for forgiveness. Does Joseph hold a grudge for the years that he spent as a slave? No. Does he go on and on about how much pain he suffered because of them? No. Though it might have been tempting to do otherwise, Joseph forgives his brothers. I would even argue that he forgave them before he ever laid eyes on them. Regardless, he shows them mercy. But that's the Old Testament, right? I mean, who really cares about that? Well, when you come to the New Testament, we hear Jesus say, love your enemies. And he says it twice before we even come to our gospel lesson that you just heard. I mean, look, it's challenging enough to love our family members and the few friends that we have, but our enemies? That's not easy. Which is why our default mode is to hate them to detest them, making what Jesus says about loving our enemies seemingly the hardest commandment to keep. Now, folks, there's a lot of moving parts in our lesson, so many, in fact, that I, I cannot cover them all. However, something to consider is that more than a commandment, when Jesus tells us to love our enemies, that is an insight into what God is like. God loves his enemies. One could even argue that from God's perspective, he has no enemies. The scriptures tell us quite plainly God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Though he can identify them as wicked, he does not gain pleasure by their death. Why not? Because the default mode of God is mercy, in that no one gets what they deserve. Sure, many, if not most, refuse God. Many, if not most, refuse all that He has to offer, saying essentially to Him, I don't want you, I don't want anything you have to give. I want to go on my own. Nevertheless, all are loved and all are cared for. The scripture says that his sun shines on the evil and the good, the just and the unjust. He provides food, nourishment, crops, harvest, rain, shelter, health, and necessary skills to all people everywhere, even to those who do not acknowledge him, worship him, or even thank him. And he does it all out of mercy. I 
love to hear the person say something to me like, I don't even believe there is a God. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> You're breathing His air, <laughs> standing on His earth, <laughs> living under His sun, and all that you have comes from Him, but yet you don't believe in Him? I can get kind of testy at times with some of these folks. Folks, without His providential open hand towards us, we would all perish. Moreover, He has sent out His truth to all men. His truth that is in nature, His truth that is in His Word. And from His Word we learn the sacrifice of His only begotten Son on the cross for all the sins of mankind, even those who are unthankful, even those who are evil. Jesus teaches that your Father in heaven is merciful. And this is something that we remind ourselves when we hear something like, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. And how do we respond? His mercy endures forever. Not until Tuesday? No, forever. And when do you sing that? After receiving the very body and blood of Christ into your mouth. Christ is poured into your ears in the absolution and in the sermon, and then He is poured into your mouth at the altar. So instead of receiving what you deserve, you receive the forgiveness of sins, you receive life, and you receive salvation. God the Father loves His enemies. God the Son does too. I mean, just consider that as the nails are hammered into his hands, Jesus keeps the beating heart of the soldier who is striking the blows. I mean, Jesus could have given the soldier a heart attack before he even picked up the hammer, but he doesn't do that. He gives the soldier life so as to continue the torture. Jesus does not lash out or condemn any of the soldiers. Instead, as you know, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So again, God the Father loves his enemies. God the Son loves his enemies. Actually, from his vantage point, he has no enemies. And neither do you. Not anymore. Being merciful is what you are to be. That you love your enemies and not seek to destroy them. Now listen, beloved. This is a very sensitive subject. I did not choose the text. <laughs> Believe me, if I could have chosen it, we wouldn't have done it. But it's in the lectionary for Trinity 4. And so we're both stuck with what Jesus says. So permit me to address two audiences. First, some of you have been hurt horribly. With this many people here this morning, there is bound to be someone here who's been deserted by someone. There's someone here who has been befriended and then been betrayed. Someone here who has wronged you and there is no denying it. But when you see them, when you see the one who has sinned against you, you cannot see them as foe. If you're a Christian, you only have one option and that is to see them as friend. Now friend doesn't mean BFF. Best friend forever. But it does mean that you may not speak ill of them or act with any mal intent towards them. I know, I know. You want vengeance. You want to extract that pound of flesh, but to follow that train of thought, a pound of flesh is rarely enough. What they did to you, You'd prefer to see them dead. And to come
come here this morning and to hear Christ teach on mercy that leaves folks alive. But you know what? It feels a little unfair. It feels like people are getting away with stuff. This is why we come to church. To hear the Word of God preached and to pray for our enemies. It's hard to hate those whom you pray for. And this is why we long to hear the absolution of our own sins, the plank in our own eyes, and to partake of the Lord's Supper. When we've been sinned against, what we want is for all the anger. What we want is for all the bitterness to be squeezed out of the situation so that our focus is to restore the other person. Just like Joseph did with his brothers just like Jesus does with you. So, Pastor, are you telling me that even though I'm the one who's been sinned against, that I have to go to him, that I have to go to her to seek reconciliation? Sometimes you do. The more mature person always moves first. That sink in. The more mature person always moves first. Now, for the person who committed the sin, friend, if you don't confess the sin, it doesn't go away. And please, please stop believing that time heals all wounds. Time does not heal, mercy heals, forgiveness heals. And then and only then does time do its work. Time by itself does not heal. Time is not a means of grace. <clears throat> sin must be confessed. And when the sin is confessed, it's like it, it's like it turns to ash and it's blown away by the wind. So stop stuffing it or pretending it didn't happen. It did happen. And you committed it. Time doesn't heal. Only Christ heals. And He only heals what you confess. And so to continue to carry it around will only destroy you in all sorts of ways. So be brave enough to seek forgiveness and reconciliation. Be humble enough to act and not ignore the sin any longer. Remember, the more mature person always moves first. You know, one of the major differences between Lutherans and American evangelicals is American evangelicals, they do a lot of stuff. They're really, really busy. But they don't know their doctrine. Lutherans, they have the right doctrine, but so many of them what? They don't do anything. Beloved, showing mercy is mature Christianity. Where we not only know our doctrine correctly, but we all grow up and we all advance in the faith. And it is, it is where the heavy lifting really is. Now let me give you some pointers. When someone confesses, this is what we are to say. I've done a horrible thing against you. Please forgive me. When that happens, do not respond with the words, it's okay. Oh, I cannot stand that. It's okay. I've done a horrible thing against you. Please forgive me. Ah, it's okay. It's not okay. It's sin. The proper response is, you did do a horrible thing to me. Christ forgives you. I forgive you. You did do a horrible thing to me. Christ forgives you. I forgive you. Mercy shows itself in forgiving, agreeing upon the sin, agreeing on the forgiveness, and if possible, if possible, 
agree on the restitution. The appropriate response after that is, what can I do to make it right? Sometimes something can be done. Money can be repaid. Property can be repaired. But sometimes, sometimes nothing can be done. And you do what you're able. You do what John the Baptist said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now gang, showing mercy like this to each other, this should be our bread and butter. Everyone should know about us when we show mercy like this towards one another. But it's not. You know why? Since we haven't done a good job of confessing, we haven't done a good job of forgiving, and since we haven't done a good job of forgiving, we haven't done a good job of moving on together in love. Church, you think we got some work to do in this regard? This is yes, this is no. <laughs> You're telling me we do. And as I said, there's so much more to say in regard to this, but I close with this. The most satisfying life, that which we all want, is to do exactly what the Lord asked you to do, but we're not good at it. We fail a lot, and we need to be forgiven. The most satisfying life is to rejoice in God's gifts. It's to be baptized. It's to confess. It's to hear the absolution. It is to receive the Eucharist. To live together in love. To care for your family. To speak well of everyone. And to think of your neighbor first. All of this stuff, you know, it's nothing new. But it's difficult to put it into practice. Now's the time, friends. Now's the time to be merciful as God the Father is merciful to you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We stand together. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue.